FYI, some of you may find what we're studying today, uh, maybe you're not ready or it's not maybe appropriate for your younger teenagers. Um, there's going to be some sex talk. Um, woo! Yeah. Uh, so if you have those younger teenagers there, welcome to go down to Axe Kids and hang out and do, uh, they're hanging out down there having a great time and learning scripture and whatever also. So if you want to do that, feel free to have them go down there now. If not, don't send me emails about words that your kids heard today that you now have to explain to them, okay? Oh, I remember when my daughter, Corey, she's about four or five years old, and she, we signed her up to play t-ball, and I helped coach her t-ball team. And if you've ever coached a t-ball team or been to a t-ball game, you know those kids are terrible athletes, Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's okay, right? But it's very frustrating, kind of, in, in a certain way, to watch them try to play. And they put the glove on the wrong hand. It's all bad. It's like, you can see that's a thumb thing, right? Like, they don't get it. They're just, it's, it's a mess. They can't throw. They can't catch. They can't hit the ball. And it's on a tee. It's not even moving. <laughs> As the season goes on, they get better. They start to throw the ball better. They can usually hit the ball off the tee eventually. Eventually, we even started pitching to them. I um, mean, they could hit a ball that was moving. I remember how proud I was of Corey when she was the first player on our team in a game to hit a ball that was pitched to her. And she was, it was, it was just a special time for me, okay? Um, t ball is kind of a mess. Kids are, they're running all over the field. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what to do. They just randomly sit down <laughs> in the infield like somebody hits a ball and a bunch of people are around. I don't feel like doing that. They just sit down. Throw their glove up in the air, throw dirt around, that kind of thing. My brother Daniel, if, if you don't know, he's not here, so I'm gonna, he's probably watching online, but he can't do anything about it. So when he was young and playing, this, he did this kind of thing until like the third grade. He was still, he'd be out in the outfield, and he was a pretty good athlete, but he had to be focused. If he wasn't focused, which was often, he'd just be out in the outfield throwing his glove up to himself and whatever, the whole game's going on, it was crazy. But anyway, these are T-ball kids, let's talk about them. It's kind of cute to see because they're so little, right? It's precious and it's kind of endearing to watch them try to play and watch them laugh and enjoy playing and getting better. But when they get older, it's not nearly as cute to watch them throw the ball in the wrong direction or put their glove on the wrong hand or things like that. In fact, at a certain age, if you're going to play baseball, you have to be pretty advanced in the game or you get cut from the team, right? There's no... There's no um, ability to play ball at a certain age if you can't play ball. So the older you get, the more is expected. It's expected that you've matured and you have a certain skill set, that you're good at baseball if you want to keep playing. Lots of practice, right? Lots of growing, lots of getting stronger has made you a competent baseball player. At that point, the coach is not going to be okay with you hitting off a tee anymore, right? That's not the way it's going to be. Our life as Christ followers... It's like that. It's like that too. When someone first becomes a Christ follower, they do not know what they're doing, okay? They don't know much of the scripture. They don't know the words to all the songs. They're excited. They're full of joy, but they haven't matured yet. And that's fine. And that's understandable. And it's even endearing to watch. It is an incredible joy to me to see a new Christ follower kind of struggling to figure it out, asking a lot of questions, right? And they're growing and they're, and they're doing doing the thing that young believers do. Young, not in age, but in knowing the Lord. It's not as cute to see a Christ follower who has been in a relationship with Jesus for five years or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years who basically can, can still not hit the ball off the tee, if you will, right? They're not growing. They're not maturing. This is what Paul says in the letter to the Corinthians church. This is three, one, three, one through three. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. Here's something from Hebrews, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you, again, the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. 
But solid food belongs to those who are full of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You've got to use it. You're going to play t-ball, you're going to practice, you're going to practice like you hit off the teeth. You're going to practice, you're going to practice, so you can hit the ball. It's going to get better and better. The ball goes faster and you throw further and you do that kind of stuff. By use, by practice. Or else what happens? You stay like a t-ball player. Like a baby. Like a child. Is this not working? No. Really? How about this one? Is this on? Hello? Oh, yeah. So you're like a baby. Like a, no. That's right. All right. Can you hear me now? You heard all the rest of that, though. I'm pretty loud. No? You want me to start over? Patrick. No, I'm getting up. We're not going to. All right. I'm taking this thing off my head, then. All right. I really don't like it when people preach with these things. I think it's weird. But, okay. Here we go. You don't want to be... You don't want to be like a baby. You don't want to stay like a baby. We're called to go beyond being babies, being children, in our journey following Jesus Christ and going into maturity. That's our call. That's our job. Or else we have to be talked to like these folks were. I can only feed you milk. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man... I put away childish things. It may be a beautiful thing for a baby to breastfeed from her mother, but it just gets weird and gross when she's 25 and still doing it, right? There's something unnatural about the person who continues to be like a child or like a baby and doesn't grow and doesn't mature. That's not what we are supposed to be. So get out of your parents' basement, kids. No, I'm kidding. That's not what this is about. But seriously, you probably should. Um, here's the thing. The natural progression of a Christ follower is to grow. That's the natural progression of a Christ follower. But we don't always grow like we should. We have to be honest with ourselves. We don't always grow like we should. And when we do grow, and this is important, sometimes we don't grow evenly. We don't grow evenly. We don't always grow evenly because sometimes we mature in certain areas, but not in other areas. Or in many areas, but not in a few areas. We leave some parts behind in the maturing process. Think about the idea of a garden, okay? Our life in Christ can be thought of like a garden. And there are a bunch of different plants in the garden. To grow evenly would mean that all the plants were growing at the same rate, they were the same size, and they were producing the same amount of fruit. Think about, I guess, like the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Imagine each one of those is a plant in the garden of your walk with Christ. Now, the plants that you feed and water and give them sunshine and do all that kind of stuff, they're going to grow, right? The plants that you don't feed and that you don't water and that you forget about, they're going to stay babies. They're not going to grow. They're not going to produce fruit. They're going to be unhealthy. I've known Christ followers who are they're crushing it when it comes to, say, long-suffering, but they're struggling when it comes to joy. I know Christ followers who are crushing it in kindness, but struggling with goodness. We can grow unevenly. It's just the bottom line. I have certainly grown unevenly in many ways in my walk with Christ. And we must be taught by the Holy Spirit and read the scriptures and welcome accountability to grow in the areas where we are struggling. The problem is that the areas where we're not growing we may not be growing because we're actually not listening to the Holy Spirit and we're avoiding the scriptures that push against us and we're rejecting accountability. Sometimes we surround ourselves with people who struggle with the same stuff that we struggle with so that we can kind of feel more comfortable at the fact that we're still struggling with it. 
instead of being around people who can make us stronger. We make excuses. Sometimes it's just that we haven't heard the teaching we need to hear. But often, we're not listening when we do get the teaching. If we want to be strong, and we want to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, we have to let him change us. We have to let him change us. That means we have to take our thoughts captive. We have to assess ourselves. We have to analyze the way we walk as Christ followers. Now, it is likely if you're a Christ follower that you have not grown perfectly evenly. That's likely. And if you have not grown perfectly evenly, you've probably done something that I'm going to call building a firewall. You've probably built some firewalls for those areas where you're not growing evenly. Now, a firewall is a computer. Computers have firewalls. You've seen that, like your firewall, whatever. What they do is they analyze information that's coming in, and they have like these rules that if certain kinds of information comes in, they get, that gets blocked. Am I right? Computer people, all right, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I don't know much about computers. Um, but that's what it does, right? So there's, there's stuff, there's information on the network coming in and out, right? This firewall is analyzing that, and then there's certain rules. It's like, oh, that's not good information. That's a hacker. That's a virus. That's a whatever, and it blocks it. Now, we construct firewalls, too, when we don't want to hear something. Certain kinds of information is coming at us, and we don't want to hear it. When you were little, you had a different kind of firewall, most of you. It went something like this. Right? That was the firewall. It doesn't work as easily when you get older. People don't like that when you do that. But that's the way we did it. Your little sister, your little brother, your mom, whatever, telling you something you don't want to hear, you don't want to deal with her, it's annoying you or whatever. Right? We get more complicated when we get older. And we have firewalls to our growth as mature believers. They're usually more sophisticated than the hands over the ears thing. But they're basically the same thing. Often it's a set of arguments that we've built up over time to sort of justify these areas where we're not growing or these areas where we have sin in our lives. Sometimes they're just simple excuses that we have, and they're ready to go, right? Let me give you an example from my own life. No, let me give you an example from, no, I'm just kidding. Don't be for me. So I like to eat food more than I need to survive, okay? Sometimes far more than I need to survive. Um, and I don't exercise as much as I should at all. <laughs> See, what I was expecting was not laughing. I thought you were going to be like, no, you look great. But no, you guys are laughing. So <laughs> that suggests you agree with me. Amen. I don't exercise as much as I should. I don't really like to exercise that much. But anyway, um, all of these things are issues about caring for the body that God has given me and exercising self-control and things like that, things that I need to grow in. Self-control is one of those fruits of the Spirit. In every area, we need to have it. There may be lots of areas where you do have it and some areas where you don't. In this case, when I come to scriptures that maybe teach about gluttony or caring for our bodies or when someone brings me some accountability, I may have any number of arguments that go in that spot. Well, this is talking about people who are worse than me about eating. This is about people who are really bad at eating, not, not me, right? Or I'm doing well with all these other things and this one's really not as important, or pizza is healthy. I put vegetables on it, right? Yes. There we go. Amen. Or I just make excuses. I'll get around to it later. I'm going to work on that. I'm too, e I'm too busy today working for the Lord to eat right or to exercise. Whatever it may be. I got a firewall. It's there. It's ready. If, if I keep using it, I won't grow. I won't grow. I can always find an argument, as you know. Or an excuse. And these things become kind of built in. They're ready. Ready to be used at a moment's notice. If I feel some accountability coming on, I've got it. Now, if we always allow our firewalls to be up, we're not going to be able to grow in these areas where we have sin or we have a lack of maturity. We have heart issues that need to be dealt with. It is a failure to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. 
if we have these firewalls, if we don't grow. Now, you may have some firewalls in your life, and some of those may come up and start popping up today as we talk with some of the things that we are going to study. I exhort you, recognize it. Recognize it. Don't let it stop you from hearing what the scriptures and what the Holy Spirit may want to say to you today. Let your thoughts be brought into obedience to Jesus Christ so you can grow evenly and be healthy and become a fully functioning man or woman of God. Now, we've been in a series called White Lies for a while now. I think this is number 14 in our White Lies series. Go figure. I guess there's a lot of lies out there that are out in the world, right? And we're not done yet, Lord willing. We've actually got some more. We have been looking at the problem lately of legalism and being judgmental. And so I think this is the third one of those that we've talked about because there's a lot there. In our study on legalism, uh, we looked at several things that Christians have been taught about legalisticness. Legalisticness? That's not a word. About being legalistic in the past. Okay? So we discussed things as complicated as alcoholism or as simple as my dad telling me I had to wear a bra if I wanted to get an earring. You guys may remember that. I didn't do that. I waited until I was older. Um, Legalism has to do with kind of a hyper focus on rules, rules for rules' sake, right? My righteousness is in the fact that I'm following all these rules. That's what legalism can be about, and most of them are rules that we make up. So the last few legalistic issues we will study, that I told you we would, are these. Sex, cussing, clothing, dancing, movies, music, video games. Okay, those are the ones that I'm going to do. There's a lot of things people have been legalistic about. I just tried to pick some. We did about half of them last time that we did this and about half this time. Uh, People have been legalistic about all of these things. So we need to figure out what is legalistic and what is just righteousness, right? Because there's something about all of these things that's righteousness, and there's something that goes too far into legalism. Let's start with cussing, all right? There are those who would say that all cussing is wrong, okay? If you cuss at all, you are sinning. That's what some people would say. That's the fully legalistic way of looking at cussing. All cussing, all the time, it's all wrong. Now, what is cussing? If you want to know what cussing is, it's going to depend on who you ask. Generally, cussing is using cuss words. That's the kind of thing it says in the dictionary, which is not very helpful, kind of a circular thing, (laughs) right? And cuss words, they're culturally defined, okay? In England, the word bloody is defined as a cuss word. And that is dumb, and that's why we kicked them out. Happy (laughs) July 4th. I'm kidding, that wasn't why. It had something to do with taxation, representation, I don't know. We have certain terms that we consider in our culture to be inappropriate words. It is not necessarily because of what they mean. Okay, for instance, if you use the word bull dung to refer to the excrement of a bull, Nobody cares. But if you use the word bullshin, you're talking about the lower leg of a bull. You see, you guys thought (laughs) legalistic people in here, you were all about to gasp. Listen. (laughs) It's not about necessarily always the definition of the words. It's just certain words that we've chosen. If you're wondering about kind of the lexicon, the words in our society that are cuss words, Just pull in front of my dad on the road, you'll hear all of them. So, no, I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's not, he doesn't, he uses alternatives, like rats. It's the kind of stuff he's, rats. Like, what is that? You know, just just say it. Or shoot, dang it. You know, that's kind of stuff. He won't say the other ones, at least not in front of me. Um, Of course, I've never cut him off on the road, so I don't know. Some cuss words are pretty filthy. Some are less that way. I know some people who are super offended by any kind of four-letter word. Just very offended. really hurts their heart to hear kind of any four-letter word. I know other people who doesn't seem to bother much at all. Okay? Um, Some cuss words for me are kind of offensive. Others are less offensive. But... As with all issues and legalistic issues and rules like don't ever cuss ever, the real issue is one of the heart. You're going to find that is consistent with all of these things. It's of the heart. Luke 6.45, a good man 
Out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Cussing can be a couple of things. It can be ugly, negative, and filthy. And it can be a sign that someone has a hard time speaking the English language well. Okay? A lot of movies now will have like triple digit F words in, in them, right? If you've written a script and it has a hundred F words and it's a hundred minutes long, you need to learn more words, right? That is a lot of one word used to mean almost everything, by the way, in those contexts. Um, so there's, there's kind of both. There's some people, it comes off as you haven't learned how to speak very well. And there is something about being a believer that suggests we should speak with some decorum, right? We should be speaking in a way that separates us from the world as Christ followers. That means we shouldn't have patterns of speech that are the same as people who do not care at all what comes out of their mouth. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that's building people up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Now, as we're reading these scriptures, by the way, there's Bibles in these chairs in front of you. If you don't have one at home, please take one of those Bibles home with you. That's our gift to you. First, a Christ follower needs to love God. And next, he or she needs to love others. Many people are offended by four-letter words, so why would you intentionally offend your brothers and sisters? Something to think about. Some people are not offended. But you should still be careful about what comes out of your mouth. Talking about filthy things with filthy language can be sinful. In fact, generally would be sinful. If you're talking about filthy things, particularly sexual stuff or you know, things like that that are filthy, and you're using a lot of filthy language, that, that's a sinful thing. It's speaking out of the abundance of your heart. Your mouth is speaking. Take it as a heart issue. It's too easy to get legalistic, and I put a list up here of words, and I go, don't ever say those. That's not how it works. It's not about that. We should be thinking about what we are saying, why we are saying it, and whether we might be offending our brothers or sisters in Christ by saying it. It's not the words. It's the heart. You can speak in very filthy language without ever using a cuss word. You can gossip. You can complain. You can talk negatively about someone behind their back or in front of their face. You can say all kinds of things that are definitely sinful and ugly without ever cussing. So it's not just about these words. We are followers of Jesus Christ. We should bridle our tongues, as it talks about in James chapter 3. Legalism doesn't help here. This word's okay. That word's not okay. You can say this word sometimes. If you're out hunting, you can do this one. Or if someone really upsets you, you can do that one. It's not like that, okay? There's not a specific thing about any of these words. This is, these are culturally driven things. We've decided that these words are whatever, okay? That's not what's important. It is the heart. Listen to Philippians 4 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That's where we're supposed to be. All right. I'll, that's all I'm going to say about cussing. Using a cuss word by itself is not some sort of horrible sin. Using cussing in the wrong place at the wrong time, time, place, and manner, saying something what's in your heart could be sinful. So act like someone who's called to be a part as a Christ follower and think about that and what comes out of your mouth. All right, let's talk about sex. Baby, let's talk about... Well, oh, that's music. We'll get to that too. All right, there's been a lot of legalism surrounding sex. In fact... Of the issues we have left, which are sex, clothing, dancing, movies, music, and video games, basically all of them are about sex, okay? Uh, if you're wondering, just first of all, just out of the gate, so you're clear if this is your first time or you don't know kind of what the Bible says about sex or what we believe about sex, God designed sexual activity for one context, okay? Human sexual activity, we were made by God, and it was designed in one context, one man, one woman in a committed marriage for life. That's it. There is not another context for human sexuality. But what about, nope. What about that? Nope. One context. One context, okay? Husband, wife, married for life. And as often as possible, okay? That's the, that's the context. You know what I'm saying, baby? No, I'm just kidding. It's just, 
I'm on the couch tonight. Okay. Um, God made the world and he made humans. So since he designed us and designed sex, he gets to say how it goes. We don't. Okay? There's nothing legalistic about that. What I just said is not legalistic. What the scripture says about sex is not legalistic. There are those who would call anything, anything having to do with sex where there was any kind of a limit on it, legalistic. That's not legalism. That's just reality and what God has made naturally in the world to work. For us, a gift for us. That's not legalism. So having a very strict view, the only view of what God has designed sex for is not legalistic. However, there are a lot of other things about sex that can be very legalistic. Uh, let's take dancing, for instance. There was a time when dancing was considered to be a sinful activity because it might arouse inappropriate sexual desires. Um, dancing is not sinful. Dancing is fun. We can worship God through dancing. That's what that, those movements that I was making up here, you thought it was a seizure? I was dancing. That's what that is. <laughs> we can show the joy of the Lord through dancing. Ballroom dancing can be a beautiful thing. I can't do it, but if you can, that's great. There's a lot of different kinds of performance dancing that are beautiful. Wonderful. The issue, again, is with the heart. Some dancing is obviously sinful. Now, if you're not familiar with that, go to the average club. Okay? The kind of dancing you will see there is basically simulated sex with clothes on. Sometimes with not very many clothes on. Right? That's not dancing. That's something else. There's a word for it. I'm not going to say it because Tiffany said I shouldn't. So, but it's not dancing, okay? That's not what dancing is. Dancing or attempts to dance that are lustful or intended to be sexual in nature are clearly sinful unless they are in the context of a husband and a wife who are married for life. In that case, please do it in your own house. We don't want to see, well, I'm allowed to, you know, we're not, don't do that. We don't want to see that. But go ahead and, you know, grind it up, you know, married couples at your house, okay, in private. Pastor David said we could. I, no. You can see why a lot of people got legalistic about dancing, because it can be. It can be that way. And this is where legalism kind of creeps in. You see that some people are using dancing in a way that is inappropriate, and you go, let's just get rid of all of it. No one can dance. And then you have Footloose, right? They get all upset. I never saw the movie, but Kevin Bacon. We don't want to be legalistic about it. Just use common sense. Just use common sense. If you're dancing, men, you're dancing with a woman, and it is in such a way that it's causing lust or it's, it's sexual in nature, she's not your wife, stop doing that. Ladies, same thing. Right? Other than that, you're a ballet dancer or whatever, you do your thing. I don't know how they do that on their toes and the whole thing. It's pretty crazy. But that's great. Dancing can be a great thing, can be a great expression. God gave us these bodies, and we use them. David would dance before the Lord, right? I do too. It probably doesn't look as good as his does. All right. We don't need to be legalistic. We just need to be reasonable. We just need to have our hearts in the right spot. Make sure we honor the Lord with our bodies and with other people's bodies. All right. Let's talk about movies, music, and video games. We're going to start with music. Some people have been legalistic about music and suggested, among other things, that Christians should only listen to music by Christian artists. Okay? That's something that was out there when I was younger. My parents didn't make me do that, but there were other people who were pretty strict about that, right? And they like burn records and whatever. If it's not Christian, if the artist isn't Christian, it's not good. Let me just tell you, that's not true. Okay? It's a lot of Christian music that is, um, especially back then, like in the 80s. There was some good stuff, and then there was a lot of not great stuff. There's better stuff now. The highest and best expression of music is in worshiping the Lord. No question. In my mind, there is no question that the very highest expression of music is in worship of the Lord. Okay? Talking about the Lord, worshiping the Lord, those are the highest expressions. But they're not the only expressions. 
They're not the only expression. It's not the only good music. The question is not whether this song was written and or performed by a Christian musician. The question is whether you can honor God in listening to it. This is the same thing with kind of everything, right? Again, we get legalistic, we make a lot of rules, but are you honoring God? Are you sowing to the Spirit? Does the music teach something true? Great. It doesn't have to be a believer. Unbelievers know some true things too. It's fine. Does music tell a story that's worth hearing? Does it lift the soul? Then listen, enjoy. Know who you are. Redeem what can be redeemed. But if the music is all about dark and filthy things, if it glorifies sinfulness, selfishness, violence, sexual immorality, then it's probably not for the Christ follower. And you probably know that already. There's plenty of good music. But where's your heart? What are you putting into your mind? What are you approving? What are you approving of when you listen to and sing along some of these songs? You're thinking of them right now, which shows how much of a sinner you are. Um, (laughs) We're to be separate from the world, right? That doesn't mean we can only listen to Michael W. Smith, but it does mean we ought not to be repeating some of the garbage that many popular songwriters are putting out. Because they're lost, and we're singing along to the anthem of lostness. We should think about that. It's not about this music's bad and this music's good and that kind of, and we got to figure out who it is. And you can't listen to this person, but you can listen to that and you can listen to this song. Yeah, it's not about that. Where is your heart? And you only have so much time to listen to music. I would pick the stuff that is the most honoring to God. Does it take you closer to the Lord or further from the Lord? I'd ask myself that question. It's not about legalism. It's about the heart. It's an easy question to always ask yourself. Does this honor the Lord? But it's actually difficult to answer sometimes. There's lots of stuff that's just kind of neutral-ish out there. You've got to make a good decision. Now, do you feel the firewalls coming up? Don't let that happen. Listen to the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. It's going to get worse here. So you're going to have to test all this by the commands of Scripture. And if it's true, you're going to have to work on it. What about video games? First of all, with video games, stop playing so many dang video games. Kids. Adults, it is a waste of your time, okay? It's a waste of your God-given time, talent, and treasure to spend all your time playing video games. They can be fun. Video games can be fun. Used to have the Atari when I was a kid, little thing, and boop, boop, boop. And then they got better and better, right? There's some really incredible video games these days. But how many hours of your life are you going to let them steal that you could be doing something useful with that time? I'm not saying never play video games. Go ahead, enjoy it. Something to be enjoyed. But my goodness, it's a lot of time and money being wasted on video games. And here's the thing. A lot of video games are just garbage. Just garbage. And you know, by the way, if you play very many video games, what I'm talking about, you know they're garbage. But your firewall kind of pops up and says, it's okay. It's okay because I don't play them for that sexually explicit stuff. I don't play them for the obscene violence. I don't play them for that for all the disturbing stuff. I just, you know, I play it for this other thing. I read it for the articles, right? Classic. (laughs) We might as well throw movies and television here now while we're just piling on, because it's basically the same issue. The first one is how much time are you spending doing that? You don't have to be a judgmental legalist to see that much of what is on television and in movies and on video games is unchristlike at the least and filthy and harmful at the worst. This is a hard issue, like all the others. Can you read Philippians 4, 8 and then press play? The verse that we just read, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Okay, play. Can you do it? I'd ask myself that. Because if you can't do that, you should be thinking about what you're watching. I am surprised by the number of Christ followers who basically have no filter for what they watch. They will watch anything. But you need to understand something if you don't already understand this. Many of the people who make the content that is on your video games, that is in the movies, that's in the television shows, it's on YouTube, are perverts. Okay? They're lost people. They have a perverted mind. They have no problem trying to conform you to the world and pervert you. You need to understand that. Listen to this. 
Uh, there's a director, I don't know how many of the episodes of Game of Thrones this guy directed, but he directed some of the episodes of Game of Thrones, I guess, and he has this con a conversation with this executive. This is what the executive says to him. This particular exec took me to one side and said, look, I represent the pervert side of the audience, okay? Everybody else is the serious drama side, but I represent the perv side of the audience, and I'm saying I want full frontal nudity in this scene, so you go ahead and do it. There's a lot of people representing the pervert side of the audience in Hollywood. It is what it is. Do you want to play into that? We've become jaded to what is essentially pornography. Firewall going up, fight it. If that happens to be connected to a story, it's basically porn, we act like it's not a problem. But it's a story. Yeah, probably porn movies are probably stories too, okay? Things that are useless to you and harm you are not for you. There's a pastor who said something like this. If you would not go over to your neighbor's yard and peek in their window while they were having sex, then you shouldn't watch strangers on TV having sex. Something to think about. I would say if you wouldn't want to have your daughter be having sex in front of a bunch of people in the whole world on TV, you probably should be watching someone else's daughter do it. Something to think about. It's not about legalism. These are things to think about. We've built some pretty significant firewalls on this issue. A couple of the arguments I've heard. It doesn't affect me. Seeing people fully naked having sex on television has no effect on me. Okay, you've become very jaded then, okay? Because you were literally designed to be aroused by nudity and sexuality. God designed you that way. So that when you and your spouse are in your bedroom, you're aroused. It's, you were designed that way. It's supposed to be in the marriage bed only, but if you're seeing it and you're like, this does nothing, then you need to ask God to unjade your heart. Second argument I've heard, it's art. Okay. <sighs> there is such a thing as art that has, to do with, that has to do with figure studies and things like that. Lots of it. Okay? There's lots of that. But on television and movies, you have about a 0.001% chance that what's being done there is art. You just heard what the executive said to the guy in that movie. It's there primarily to sell women's bodies to lustful men, period. That's what it's there for, okay? If you don't understand that, then you don't understand economics and what, what people who make content are actually doing, and you don't understand the depravity of the human heart if you think that what most of these people are doing is trying to make art. And the average movie that's, that's given to 12 to 25-year-old men. Here's one. The story is good. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. That doesn't, da that doesn't justify the damage that's being done primarily to women by this kind of content. You need to think about it. I could go on. People have some pretty significant firewalls on this issue. I'm not going to sit there and, and deal with all of the arguments that you may have. And I'm not trying to be legalistic and make a bunch of rules about what you can or cannot watch as a Christian. I have my own uh, ideas on this between myself and the Lord and my wife and our family and what we've decided to do, you should also have some kind of idea of what is appropriate for you as a Christ follower and what is not. It's not about making a bunch of rules. It's about the heart. It's not legalism. I'm just telling you to be serious and check your heart. Are you honoring God? Are we honoring our sisters and our brothers who are made in the image and likeness of God? with what we're watching. It's not about what a movie or a video game or a TV show is rated and care about that. It's about where our hearts are. It's about where our hearts are. I'm not, I'm not giving you, I can't give you some blanket rule. I can tell you this, you know. You know. We need to ask ourselves whether we become jaded. Men, here's a good exercise. After church today, go home and ask your wife what she thinks about some of the things you're choosing to watch and tell her to be completely honest and that you're not going to get upset about it and see what you hear. You may be surprised. I'm guessing you will be surprised by what you hear. All right, last legalism for this morning, Lord willing, let's get to clothing. All right. There have been people who have been very legalistic about clothing. In fact, there's some Christian groups where they basically all wear the same thing, right? Like a dress down to there with the head covering and the guys wear a certain kind of suit, like Amish people. You've seen that, right? Amish people. Um, that's, they've, they've made a decision about clothing, okay? They want to they 
have a certain level of simplicity and modesty and so on. Um, that's legalistic. When you say everybody has to wear the same thing, that is almost the definition of legalistic. There are some Christ followers who are very strict about what they can wear. We need to avoid legalism in this area, but we do need to check our hearts also. Let me start with men because men are easier. Listen, if you're in good shape, if you're a man, you're in really good shape, you're just ripped and whatever, and you, and you wear like super tight shirts, like it's an extra small and you should be wearing a large, um, let me just tell you, when you're doing that to show off your body, you're probably causing some of your sisters to think about you in a sexual way when they would prefer not to. They prefer not to have that temptation, okay? I can see that doesn't apply to anybody in here, so I'm going to move on to... <laughs> not something I have to worry about, you know? If I wear a super tight shirt, no one is stumbling, okay? Not for that reason. <laughs> not for that reason. And there might be other stumbles like, oh! Uh, dry heaving, I've seen that, but... So if you have that issue, just don't do it, okay? It's not honoring to our sisters to accentuate our bodies in a way that's likely to lead to a struggle. Women, this issue is different for you. Men were designed and made to be very visual. You probably know this. You are valuable. You are made in the image and likeness of God. You have so many gifts and talents and abilities. God has so many plans for you. You are so important. You are so much more than a body. Do not believe what society tells you that your value is primarily in your body. The amount of time. And listen, if you don't know this, brothers, you need to know this about our sisters. The amount of time, effort, and energy that they have to spend being concerned about the way they look, because they're concerned about the way that people will perceive them or value them based on it, is so broken. We, as men, over time, and certainly now, have created a society where so many, particularly of our young women, grow up absolutely believing that their primary value is in their body and how it looks. That's primarily where they get their value from society. That's what they believe. I could cry because I have a daughter. And I have a mother and I have a wife and I have a sister. And I have many sisters in Christ in this room. And I know that there's a struggle for many of you. You are so important. You're so valuable. God has great plans for you. You are not a second-class citizen in the kingdom or anywhere else. You are our sisters, you know. Even your wife is one day going to be your sister. Gross, right? No. <laughs> Listen, we're going to live forever. There's no marriage or being given in marriage in heaven. You need to feel loved. You need to feel honored. You need to feel valuable. I want you to. You are so much more than a body. Make sure that you understand that there are many men who struggle with lust. Partially because the way they were designed was to have those feelings towards their wife in their own bedroom, but sometimes things spill out and aren't just in the bedroom. When you dress in a way that is particularly designed to accentuate your body, the reality is that men are likely to have sexual thoughts about you. That's the reality. It's not fair. In fact, it's incredibly sinful for men to do that. But we live in a fallen world, and we can't ignore that fact. And we can't ignore that loving our neighbor sometimes means not purposely provoking areas where they struggle. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a man wanting to look handsome or a woman wanting to look beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. God created you in his image and likeness. That's awesome. That's great. Those things can be good. But we all need to know the line between handsome and beautiful and sexually provocative. Sexually provocative means that the way you are dressed is provoking people's lust. Sexual lust. This is an incredibly uncomfortable thing to talk about, by the way. But it is a real problem. 
It is a real problem. And I don't want to, here's the thing that's so important to me. I don't want any of the women who are in the body of Acts Church to be viewed in any way other than as a fully honored human being made in the image and likeness of God who we are here to serve. I don't want there to be any other thought about any woman in this church. That's what I want. That's what the elders of this church want. And so we need to be careful. Men, you're responsible for your own eyes, okay? Don't blame women. No, she wore blah, blah, blah. What do you expect? I expect you to be a man, a godly man. Avert your eyes if you have to avert your eyes. Deal with it. But women, I also ask you to have a heart for your brothers and recognize. If you're showing a lot, a lot of tight this and that and whatever, you're going you're to cause them to struggle. It's not your fault. I'm not saying it's not their fault. I'm just, I'm just telling you the reality. We, should, we need to think about that. I have no rules to give you on this issue. I'm not going to say, I don't remember what it was. My, I think my mom said when they were young, skirts had to come. I guess if you got on your knees, it had to hit the floor like this many inches. I, I don't have all that for you, okay? I don't know. I don't know. You know. Ask yourself, what am I trying to do here? Nothing wrong with I want to look beautiful. I want to look handsome. Something wrong with I want people to look at me and think I'm hot. Right? Which there's nothing, by the way, just so you know, I know this seems really ironic. There's nothing I can do about the fact that I'm so hot. I'm try- I wasn't trying to this morning, okay? There is a difference. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Now, in the context of the first century, some of you are like, my hair is braided, oh my gosh. Look, in the context of the first century, we're talking about women who are dressing in such a way as to draw attention to themselves, particularly in the context of the church. Well, we're here to worship God, and they've got hair braided with gold and pearls and and whatever, and it's distracting to other women, to men, and so on. Don't be a distraction. Neither men nor women should be dressed in such a way as to draw attention to themselves immodestly. We need to grow and mature and understand what it means to follow Christ. Not be legalistic. But check our hearts. What we want to do is we want to do the right thing without pushing all the way, the pendulum all the way over here to be legalistic and get rid of everything. But that means we have to mature and we have to grow evenly. We need to understand what it means to follow Christ, to love our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're in a broken world. We are. But we as Christ followers are called out. We are called to be different. Our men should be known in this church as those who love and serve and lay down their lives for their wives, for the church, in maturity, kindness, love, cherishing one another. Our women should be honorable and be honored. That's what we should be doing. That's what Christ did. He honored women. They should be growing as Christ followers also, trusting God for everything and not moved by the things that the other women of this world are moved by. Our men should not be moved by what men in this world are moved by. Our women should not be moved by what women in this world are moved by. We are different people. All right, I got to close it up here. We talked about a lot of stuff. These are not my favorite kinds of sermons, (laughs) talking about legalism and like uh, things that people have made lots of rules about. I, I do care about the heart part. I really do. And I do care about the grace that God has for us. Let me just tell you something really important here. This is the whole thing with legalism. Do not think that because you can go, I check all those boxes. I never watch anything but a G movie and I've never said a bad word and I blah, blah, blah. That doesn't make you saved or right because of that. Morality alone doesn't save you. And if you're saying, I mess up in all of these things, that doesn't mean that you're unforgivable. Jesus has grace for you. If you need, if you've been growing unevenly and you need to start watering this plant over here, then start watering it. God's there for you. He's there for you. 
1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't be legalistic, but let's get our hearts right. We want to be something. We want to have a powerful impact in this community, in this neighborhood, in this city, in the Portland metro area, in the northwest, in the world. You want to do that? we got to get things right here at home. we got to grow evenly. You are the base. You are those who God has called here to be part of something that he is doing that is much bigger than just us who are sitting right here. Those who he is going to be calling into his kingdom. You are the ones who get to be part of that. And you are the ones who they will look to. If your garden has one good plant and a bunch of messed up ones, that's not going to help in the discipleship process. Remember, we're to make disciples. So let's work on this. If you don't know Jesus, hey, today's the day. Like I say, it's not about legalism, but he'll forgive you. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it this morning. That's all you have to do. It's not about rules. It's about God. It's about being different. It's about being set apart. It's about living for him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Lord, we're sorry that we get legalistic and try to make a bunch of rules about things. But we do ask you that you'd speak to our hearts and that our firewalls would go down. That we might understand what righteousness looks like. That we would hunger and thirst for righteousness. God, forgive me for the fruits of the Spirit that I have not watered and grown and allowed your Holy Spirit to grow in me. Help me to grow evenly. Lord, I pray for those who are still hitting off the tee, that they would grow up in you, that we would put away childish things and be men and women of God. Lord, forgive our sins. Lord, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you, I pray you draw them to you right now, today, that they might also stand with us as those set apart. Lord, the world's way is not working. Please stop having us live in it and like it and love the things of it. Because if we do, we're not loving you. Friendship with the world is enmity with you, Lord. We are your friends. Show us what it looks like to live holy and pure and loving and hope and grace and peace. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen.